Classic. Um, if you haven't already signed up for the streaming, D1 Baseball is going to be streaming these games. Uh, they have a promo code on. Uh, if, you, if you don't know the promo codes, follow Kendall Rogers. He has a promo code on Twitter. You can get, I think it's 15% off. Kendall Rogers is on the show right now. I appreciate him coming on. He can tell you all the details. I'm trying to give him a pub, but I'm probably messing it up. Kendall, thanks for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. Dude, it's good to be back. Hey, did I see a champagne bottle during the commercial break? Yeah, here? yeah. That's exactly that's, what you saw. That's a Lloyd. That's a, I love that they got the Tigers in the background. That's a nice... That's a nice. Hey, you know, uh, hey, you, know you mean business when you're bringing up the champagne on a, on a Wednesday night. Right? Yeah, I know. That's that's a, that's a that's a Lloyd move. We actually have a funnel, and every Friday we make him funnel one of our Heineken Silvers uh, on the it's show. It's not going okay. great, but I'm trying my best. Yeah, I'm we're, we're working on it. It's like he's never went to college. Before his, life. <laughs> his performance with oh. it is subpar, but we're working on it. Not only that, we're college at LSU. Come on, man. Exactly. You gotta, and you gotta he's got the brand a little bit, dude. And he's got a mullet. I mean, he's just—he's literally <laughs> insulting the mullet people. He's, he's got like the—he's got like the uh, Southern Louisiana starter kit. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Oh, uh, Kendall, man. But, but so I can defend myself. First of all, I would drink every single one of you under the table. That's, okay. And I think that's yeah, I'll, but not, yeah. not, 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 not without PEDs. Get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Get out of here. If you got them, use them. Nah, uh, you're cheating. Man. Uh, you know what? I've always been one of those people. Like, I'm kind of, like, proud that I don't have to, like, drink a ton to, to get the, to get the yeah. trip done. <laughs> you're like, a cheaper day. calories, man. Hey, dude, when you're, when you're bigger guys like me, you know, you don't want to get those extra calories. No doubt. No, I, I respect that. I respect you. Know it works for you. Here. you know it works for you, and you stay with what it goes. And you know, Exactly. You, Big you tree get, fall hard. You get right? drunk, yeah, you get, you get drunk for less money and less calories. I think that's a, that's a good point <laughs> right there. Um, Amen. Let's jump, let's jump into this, man. I, I appreciate you coming sure. on the show. Obviously, you know, we talk a lot about LSU here, but we also talk a lot about SEC baseball and college baseball in general. Um as far as the landscape, before we really jump into LSU and what you see and what you expect from this team, as far as the landscape goes in college baseball and the SEC in particular, is this the best and the deepest that you've seen college baseball in a long time? It is, man. And I'll tell you what, it's kind of funny. We always talk so much about uh, SEC football, but I mean, SEC baseball is, is deeper than SEC football. And I think overall, it's better top to bottom. I mean, I think when you look at this league, you, know, you think about Missouri, you know, think about when you play like Missouri. Uh, you know, wasn't very good. And, right. you know, Missouri goes on the road to the, to, you know, the college baseball showdown over the weekend, uh, you know, beats Texas and, and goes two and one. They beat TC. They go two and one. So they beat two of the top four teams in the Big 12. And you know what? They got to Mars, but I can promise you they're probably going to finish in the bottom two or three in the SEC. So it gives you an idea how deep this conference is this year. It's pretty incredible to say the least. And honestly, it will not happen, but it really should be like SEC softball where pretty much every team gets in. That, that's how good I think this league is. Yeah, and, and I, I, staying on the SEC, you know, it's, it's, I think they had seven out of ten in the preseason top ten, right? I think there was, yeah. I don't know, ten or eleven teams, maybe more than that, in the top yeah. 25, right? So obviously they have a ton of hype. Is there a team in the SEC that people aren't really talking about that you should look at and say, hey, you know what, be careful. Like if these guys kind of figure it out. You know, kind of like an A&M last year, right? Nobody was really talking much about yeah. A&M. They came out of nowhere. Yeah, South Carolina is that team. South Carolina has pretty much, you know, we were talking about starter kits, I'm going to go with champagne and, and alcohol. But, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, South Carolina's got kind of the A&M starter kit from last year. If you look at those guys overall, you know, they went out and hit the portal hard. They went out and got Will McGillis from, you know, Southern Miss. They went out and got some other portal guys. And then you look at their, their pitching staff. Uh, and they have a you know potential first round pick of Will Sanders on Friday night. Kate Austin's back the back in the bullpen, uh, and they've got some really nice pieces on the mound. So South Carolina has followed the A&M model. They've gone out and gotten a lot of guys that have had a lot of college at bats. And as you guys well know, uh, having a lot of at bats means a lot in college baseball. So keep it on South Carolina. I'm I'm not that sold on them just yet, but they're as about as close to A&M last year as you're going to get. Uh, so, I mean, you talk about South Carolina and you talk about Missouri already. Who else mm -hmm. in the SEC right now to start this thing? Like, of, of what you've seen so far this year, and obviously it's a very, very, very small sample, but what you've seen so far this year, who else right now is impressing you and you're thinking, like, this This is another team to keep a real eye on? Well, I mean, I'm going to give you a really obvious one that I think has played really well the first, you know, four games. And that's Ole Miss. Uh, you know, it's it's one it's it, you know it's one thing to win a national championship, 
but they come back the next year, and I think it's easy, even against the opponents they're playing, it's easy to have a hangover. And I tell you what, you know, Ole Miss right now is hitting the cover off the ball. You know, Peyton Shotney, we just talked about how important it is to have a bats in college baseball. You're talking about a guy that, you know, has probably had, I don't know, 650 to 700 bats in college baseball. You know, he's hitting 583 right now. Ethan Groff, the Tulane, uh, you know, the Tulane product transferred to Ole Miss in the offseason. He's off to a terrific start. I don't know. I actually – don't know how in the world Tulane even let him leave. Like, he's one of those guys. Like, I'm getting any kind of NIL deal I can get to get him to stay at Tulane. Uh, he's off to a great start. And they've got some young arms. You know, Grace Sonia uh, has gotten off to a really good start for them. So, you know, Ole Miss has played well. Mississippi State has not played very well. They have 10 errors uh, in three games over the weekend. Uh, their pitching was abysmal for the most part, but they did bounce back today. I don't know, you boys not want to go look at this home run. Dakota Jordan, one of the more talented freshmen in the country, hit a ball 475 feet tonight against Yale Monroe. It was a bomb. And by, by the way, Mikey, uh, if only you could have played with the ball that these guys are playing with right now. I don't care what anybody says, dude. This ball is crazy. Is here. that is that the deal? Is it like the is it like the big league ball? Or they 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 kind of change it so they they changed the bats and made them worse, but they made the balls better. Yeah. Is that kind of how it worked? So what I think happened, you remember a couple of years ago when the big leagues like got rid of a bunch of balls, and I think I think they got rid of like twenty thousand balls because they thought they were juiced up. Honest to God, I think they took those balls and just put the college scenes on them. <laughs> I mean, so here, so here's a stat for you. So last year, opening weekend, seven hundred fifteen home runs, right? Right. Opening weekend, two thousand twenty three, eight hundred and fifty two. Wow. I mean that that is a ridiculous like growth you know growth percentage. Do you think the home run record of 188 can ever get beat that LSU had? Is that is that is that in uh, is that in danger? No, I mean well, I mean back then they were using juice balls <laughs> and juice, juice bats. bats and juice. I mean, I about and juice. juice. That's and not the only juice. We- <laughs> well, I, I wasn't going to say that. I was going to let y'all because I, I you know if I said that. Tiger droppings would have a free uh-huh. party with me. <laughs> if you know what tiger dropping is, obviously you've you've been on there before. Hey, hey, nobody had more impressive forearms than Blair Barbier, man. No doubt. No, <laughs> Blair's a great guy. He's I love unbelievable me. guy. I love me some Blair Barbier. Did more hammer curl. I mean, you know, I, either he had really good protein or he had, he had a hell of a hammer curl routine. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Okay, so we're talking we're talking SEC. We're talking teams that are surprised you positively. Obviously, it's super early in the season. Yeah. Everybody wants to overreact early on. Tennessee starts the season one and two. I think they won last night, or they're winning tonight. I think so. They're going to be two and two to start yeah. the year. Um, what happened over the weekend with them? Obviously, people love to hate Tennessee. I know they have LSU and Tennessee over the last couple of years have had you know have kind of yeah. knocked heads. I think that's really good for for baseball. I think having that type of chippiness is great. What have you seen from them, and what do you think the reasons of of why they they lost that series? Well, I can give you one big reason. They'd have three of their best players. I mean, Malia Hoon is an All-American. He didn't play because, you know, there's quote-unquote, you know, their NC is quote-unquote looking at tampering in the transfer portal right. when he moved, moved from Kansas to Tennessee. I think they're honestly just making him sit out a couple of weeks to basically prove a point. So they didn't have him. They didn't have Griffin Merritt in their lineup. He was a, the reigning American Conference Player of the Year, you know, over a guy like Ethan Groff. He didn't play for him over the weekend. And by the way, here, here's the one thing nobody's talking about. And, like, I totally get it. Grand Canyon's a whack team. They're a good whack They're team, good, by the way. Yeah. They, they, right. they could very well have the best player in college baseball outside of Dylan Cruz and Jacob Wilson. But, like, people, like, go dig in the box score. So, Grand Canyon did this. How about this, dude? You, you play teams in midweek where they feel like they're ace, right? Yeah. I mean, Grand Canyon threw their, their number two starter is, is a starter in that game. They came, they brought in their number three starter in relief, and they brought back their Friday dude to, to wow. throw the, the final inning just to get that win. So they threw all three weekend starters, including the reigning black pitcher of the year, to win that game. So, I mean, yeah, it it's, hard, it's hard to fault Tennessee very much, but I, I think Tennessee will be fine. I think once they get all their guys back to the lineup, they won't skip a beat. I mean, all, you know, they were solid on the mound. Uh, I, I think they're still going to be really, really good. Last base, NCAA baseball question, SEC baseball question, before we move on to LSU is pitch clock, right? Obviously, I came up, oh me and Jared came up through minor league baseball, and the pitch clock was a thing. They've steadily, you know, decreased the amount of time you have to get in the box and to make a pitch. Yeah. So they're trying to speed the game up. 
What's your feelings on that? Because it's, you've already seen guys getting punched out because of the pitch clock, guys getting balls, getting walking guys because of a pitch clock. Yeah. Like, what's your feelings on the pitch clock? Well, so positive and negative, and I'll give you the, the quick positive. It, it is going to make games shorter. I mean, if you look at LSU's games over the weekend, they were pretty quick for the most part. Um, I think the uh, we, we were able to get game times for 75% of the games in college baseball over the weekend, and the average time of the game was 15 minutes shorter. When you're talking about trying to sell college baseball to the masses, you're trying to sell college baseball to the casual fan, 15 to 20 minutes is actually a pretty big deal. Yeah. And so that is a positive. The negative is it's it's putting way too much pressure on umpires. While, you know, kind of looking at the college baseball showdown over the weekend, the home plate umpire, as soon as he went behind the plate, and as soon as the pitcher got on the mound, was having to signal to the press box or you know whoever's running the clock to start the clock. So you're you're asking a guy to make close calls uh, in the field, go behind the plate, signal to a clock operator, and oh by the way. Two seconds later, you want him to make a, per, a perfectly good strike, right. striker ball call. So uh, I can tell you, if it is like it was in Arlington last weekend, uh, it's going to end up being a big deal because I think they rung up four, well, no, three people struck out, one in the, eight, in eight, in the bottom of the eighth inning right. when they were losing. Right. Three people struck out because of the rule, and three and three or four people actually walked because of the rule. So uh, it had a pretty profound effect on the tournament. Yep, no doubt. And that's, that's kind of, I think that's what everybody's starting to see. Obviously, you, you see it could happen in the first inning. It's not going to make a difference. It happens in the eighth inning. Yeah. And it kind of starts determining games. People are going to start raising questions, asking questions, and, and kind of getting upset Correct. about it. But, and there, but there, there's also huge turning points in the game, too, yep, where it can happen. Like I, I don't know if you noticed this, but there was an LSU's Tuesday game, I want to say, in that – in that inning where they came back, they were down four nothing. They put a five spot in that inning. Yeah. I think there was an O two call that was a ball call because of the pitch clock that got it to one two, and now the two two pitch. Yeah. I mean, the one two pitch ends up getting hit, run score, and I think those those counts like that end up shifting at bats more than you think. No doubt. Yeah, and it, you know that's a great point. And I think the other thing too is umpires don't like it. I mean, right. every umpire I spoke with did like it, and here's why. Imagine. Uh, imagine if you're calling a, a regional in Baton Rouge, LSU, uh, you know, is down by one run of bases loaded in the bottom of the eight, and let's just say Paxton Clean is out of the box one second over the clock. Could you imagine <laughs> oh, LSU sees an ending on that kind of call and having the young pirate be blamed for it? Right. Oh, my God. I mean, I'm being serious. Like, I mean, yeah, it, it wouldn't matter if it's an LSU, Texas, or A&M. Like, he's probably getting a death threat. That's not to say somebody's going to act on it. But, like, it, it just yeah. creates unwanted situations right. that I just don't think need to happen. Absolutely. It should be a part of the game. I, yeah. I, would, I would agree. Right. It's just it's hard. It's, gonna, it's hard to learn on the fly. But, you know, it's, it's a rule, and they're going to have to deal with it. And we'll see kind of – hopefully it doesn't affect it to, to that extent. But, yeah. you know, TBD. Um, all right. So, LSU opens the season. Obviously, they're the unanimous number one team in the country. They, and all, major four, all four major polls, preseason number one – have, in my opinion, some of the most one of the most talented teams in the history of LSU. Potentially, yeah. right? They got to go out there and they got to do it and they got to perform. Obviously, all those types of things. But they go out there and they take care of business this weekend with Western Michigan. All the guys that came in, minus Tommy White, who went down. Hopefully, you know he's back here soon. You know, perform to the to the extent that you expected. They're going to face their first big challenge this weekend in Round Rock, and then next next Tuesday. With LSU, what have you seen over the first weekend, and what do you want to see over these next four games? Well, I think the biggest thing for me is Paul Skeens is a real deal. You know, I saw Paul last year pitch for Air Force, and you know, it was primarily a two pitch guy. I'm granted, he threw a, a, a you know plethora of sliders over the weekend, but you know, the slider wasn't as sharp as it as it was in that that game on Friday. Right. The fastball last year didn't have quite the zip on it that it does now with Wes Johnson. Uh, and that changeup, you know, is a pitch that, you know, he only threw a couple of times, at, you know, over the weekend against the Broncos. But, um, you know, it, it's going to be a, a weapon for him. You're talking about a guy that's going to sit 98 to 101, and he's going to throw a changeup at like 92 miles per hour, per hour to go with that slider 86, 87. So he, I mean, he looks like the real deal. And last year he was really good. He wasn't this good. And so, you know, the thing about Paul that's really interesting is when he's on the mound, I mean, it looks like the dude is throwing, like, you know, like a miniature baseball or something. Right. Like, that's how big his hands look. So he's just a 
he's just a special player. And, you know, I think when you look at the, the rest of that team, you know, Trey Morgan obviously had a great showing uh, in the midweek, you know, hitting for the cycle. Dylan Cruz is going to be Dylan Cruz. I, I love the two freshmen and, and, and Jared Jones and Paxton Clean. And assuming Tommy White comes back, I mean, the, the thing about this lineup is, you know, people talk about talk so much about the top. But I like some of these other pieces. You know, Gavin Dugas has been in the program for a while. Uh, Jordan Thompson has been in the program for a while. He's a guy that Jay and the ball thought had, had really made big improvements. And really, if you look at JT's numbers last year, offensively, I mean, the dude hit for some pop. So yep. I think this lineup top to bottom is really good. Obviously, the top, the, you know, the top three, four, five guys are the elite of the elite. But uh, I think for me, when I look at LSU and, you know, my job is to put holes in the team. Uh, my thing for LSU is, you know, Thatcher Hurd wasn't great against Southern. And for LSU to get to the level that they want to get, which is to win the seventh national title in program history, uh, you know, you need guys like Thatcher Hurd performing. You need, uh, you know, you, you need Chase Shores to make a quick transition. Uh, you know, theoretically, you want to be going into conference play and no disrespect to Riley Cooper, but I think you want to go into conference play with a rotation with guys that are, you know, what I would call prospecty premier arms. Yeah. And so, right. but, you know, maybe, maybe maybe the formula is Riley Cooper. I don't know, but it's hard to imagine Riley Cooper sustaining that level in an entire SEC schedule. Yeah. Now, this weekend, they're going to have their biggest challenge, obviously. It's four games in. They're going to face Kansas State, Iowa, and Sam Houston. I don't know. Admittedly, don't know much about those teams <laughs> outside of the fact that Jay came on our show on Monday and said apparently Iowa has got a guy that throws like 110 miles an hour or something. I don't know, <laughs> uh, and so uh, you can get you fill me in on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll be really honest. Kansas State's not very good. I mean, they have to cut. So two guys, I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of guys to watch for Kansas State. Keep it on Kayla Culpepper, their talented third baseman, and Nick Goodwin, their talented shortstop. They're they're both good prospects. They're really athletic guys. You know, Kaylin's one of the more talented guys in the, in the sophomore class. Uh, if they can get going, Kansas State can be scary. K State did lose all three weekend starters from last year. Uh, same Eastern State, you know, they're they're a perennial solid mid major. I would say they're kind of like La Tech light. You know, La Tech's really good every year as a, as a upper mid major. Same Eastern State for the most part is pretty good every year as a mid major. And so you know, keep it, keep it on those guys. Walker Janik, the really really talented player for the Bearcats. But the dude to watch this weekend is for Iowa, and that's uh, Brody Brett. Uh, you know, you, you just mentioned it a minute ago. I don't think he throws 110, yeah. but I mean, the dude. I, I was talking, you know, talking to Rick Keller, their head coach, the other day. I mean, the guy averaged 99 on TrackMan uh, for five innings with his fastball, and so he's got a massive arm. And by the way, Jared, I like this. He's also a, an Iowa football player. So you're talking about a guy with an Iowa football background. Um, that can throw a baseball 99. It makes me wonder if he can play quarterback for Iowa. <laughs> Seriously. Is he, is he a big dude? That was the uh, – so I, I mean, they could yeah, score less points. 6'4", 235. There it is. Boom, that's there. what I said. Over and over. All, all right. right. All right. I was making sure. I was like, so, I don't see him being a 6'1", 185-pound guy from Iowa. I think nah, he's nah, going to be – he's a donkey, nah, man. Yeah. yeah. That's what we figured, too. So, you, I mean, you kind of ran through and outlined this LSU team a little bit. Who, which one of these young guys, because I think we were all pretty surprised as when this lineup came out to start the year, and obviously the lineup changed pretty much all four of these games yeah. so far, but which one of these young guys do you see kind of rising to the top and basically being that freshman or that premier freshman that basically takes a spot and doesn't let it go for the rest of the year? Well, i got to give a lot of props to Jared Jones. I mean, you're talking about a guy who not only is hitting for power, he's driving and runs. And by the way, he's throwing a really mature approach. He's got, yeah. what, four or five yep. walks Agreed. already this year. But I'll tell you what, you know, we're, again, I'll kind of go back to our starter kit joke earlier, but like Paxton Clean, like to me, just looks like a Dylan Cruz starter kit. He reminds me a lot of Dylan physically when he was a freshman at LSU. Dylan was a little thicker, but like, you know, the, the, the hair, the, you know, kind of the, just the body type, the, the way he approaches things at the plate. Paxton reminds me a lot of Dylan. I know he's off to a little bit of a, a slow start, but he's a guy that I think is going to have a monster year for that. Yeah. Uh, he, I, you know, if I was a betting man, I'd say he hit three, three ten, three thirty, something like that, with double digit home runs. I think he's an absolute stud. But Jared Jones, the thing that stood out to me about him when I saw LSU in the fall was just the raw power. It was just like everything off his bat was hard contact, and you're kind of seeing it so far this year. Yeah. 
Speaking of Dylan Cruz, obviously he's projected to go one overall or one of the the handful of yeah. guys that can go one overall. Are you on par with that? Do you think he is the number one overall yes. pick in the draft? I agree. I love everything about him. Uh, you know, I, again, my job is to, to try to find a way to poke holes into somebody, and it's hard and with Dylan. I, I mean, you could really – I guess you could argue that his, his walk uh, strikeout ratio could be a little bit better. But, I mean, you're talking about a guy – who has a plus approach to the plate, has plus power at the plate, has a great frame, great swing. The, the, and the thing I like about him too, and I'm really big on this, when I go and watch players, like I'm really big on demeanor. Like I want to yeah. see yeah. like how they react in the game. Like for instance, again, I, I, I'm not hating on Tennessee, but like when I watch Drew Gilbert, like it concerns me because he's ultra emotional. He plays like, he, you know, he, he constantly plays – like he's offended or like somebody made him mad. And Dylan's just one of those guys, like, you could have a, a Cajun yelling at him out behind third base and calling him every name in the book. And it's like the dude just got just has blinders and earplugs on. And I think that certainly serves him well now, but it's gonna serve him even even better at the next level. Yeah. So obviously he's one overall. Paul Skeens has probably has the potential to go top five, maybe contend for the number one overall. Is there somebody yeah. else on this team? right now that you think that you know obviously trey morgan can go out there and and can you know hit his way into do you see somebody that can maybe sneak back in sneak into the first round outside of those two guys oh sure ty floyd yeah Yeah. that's i agree i think ty floyd i mean outside of grant taylor that's what just kills me about grant taylor getting hurt is like grant was phenomenal right the day i saw lsu in, in lafayette but outside of him because paul skeens didn't pitch um, that day, uh, Ty Floyd was the best arm I saw. I mean, the, the breaking stuff was on point that day. It was up to 96, 97 with the fastball. And I, and I love seeing it because Ty was one of those guys. I remember Paul Maneri was telling me out of high school that had a huge arm. He's like, you know, I remember him telling me the, the, you know, at the beginning of the fall, like, Hey, you're going to love this guy. And so I went and watched LSU that fall because, you know, I always go to the purple and gold series. So it was November. And he's still like 91, 92. And so I'm sitting there looking at a radar gun like, man, do I need to like recalibrate this thing? Right. And Paul's just like, yeah, his velo it just hasn't been what it was in high school. And so, like, Todd Floyd showed these glimpses in high school, didn't really show it the first couple of years, but it's finally clicking for him. He's obviously finally very healthy. So uh, he, he's one of those guys. And, you know, I wouldn't discount Trey. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't really know where he projects the next level. I mean, you don't really see many first basemen in Major League Baseball with his frame. I'll tell you what, the guy's a heck of a defender over there. He saves a lot of runs for LSU. And he's certainly a very pure hitter. And, again, we we talked about Dylan and his mentality. I mean, Trey's as, as good of a kid as it gets and certainly a, a like consummate hard worker. So, obviously, his first outing in purple and gold wasn't – basically what you would want it to be. But I think we can all agree if LSU is going to get where they want to go at the end of the year, you're going to need a lot more production out of Thatcher Hurd. Can you explain what it is that you see out of him when he is pitching his A game? Well, when he's pitching his A game, it's elite spin. I mean, I I think back to um, when I saw him in the fall and his breaking ball that day, his, his slider, the spin rate averaged 3,000 to 3,200. And, you know, you guys play pro ball. That's pretty good. Yeah, average, uh, yeah, that's that's like that's like well above major league average. So when Thatcher Hearn is right, I mean it's ninety one, ninety four, bumping five with the fastball. He's going to dump that slider in there with those elite spin rates. And and the big thing for Thatcher is commanding that slider with those spin rates. It's one thing to throw with with crazy spin, but if somebody's laying off of it and you're not getting over the plate. Who cares? So that'll be the big thing for him. But there's no doubt he's got elite potential. And he was on his way to having a phenomenal freshman year until he had that uh, back issue last year. Yeah, Kendall, man, I, I appreciate your time. Just a couple more questions. I obviously signed up for the streaming D1 pass for this weekend because I want to watch the Tigers play. If everybody else, if anybody else wants to sign up and be able to get the weekend pass, uh, how do they do that? Is there a code? Is there something they can use to be able to, to, be able to uh, sign up? No. Yeah, man. So you go to just d1baseball.com, click on streaming, uh, sign up for the weekend path, put in the code L- LSUKRR, uh, Carbach Roundark, and that will give you uh, 15% off. I've had a lot of questions of people, and uh, you know, you, you guys are young bucks, so you'll know what I'm talking about, but I've had a lot of people reach out. I had an 86 year old woman from Covington uh, call me the other day because I am a d1baseball customer service. 
So she calls me and says, Hey, I don't know, you know, I don't know how to get the straightening on my TV. So she was the sweetest old lady, and I talked to her and I said, you know, hey, just pull up your iPhone, pull up your tablet, click on uh, click on airplay, or you can go old school and put your HDMI on your TV. But you know what? I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, we, we've pumped uh, quite a bit of money into, you know, having a 1080p production. We're bringing in Ben McDonald for the weekend, Kyle Peterson, Chris Berg. So all the guys that you see at the Cobble Series on ESPN will be doing these games, and we can be more excited to get Paul Skeens and the Tigers, in, you know, game one in our premium game. You can't, I can't wait. Well, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it. I'll, what's wrong? What's wrong? No, what? I'm wondering, how are you going to do the production on this thing? Do you have them, like, zoom in, and they're going to be, like, in separate boxes? Are they coming in studio? Like, no, what's this gonna man, look they're like? all on the same team. Come on, dude, if you think we are. No, <laughs> I mean, let's dude. say it. Lloyd's trying to, Lloyd, Lloyd does a production here. He tries to do half-ass production sometimes. Yeah, okay. let me do Yeah, man, go hard or go home, Luke. Hey, hey, we can get people in studio to struggle sometimes. <laughs> feels like you're here um yeah man i'm, I'm looking forward to this weekend I, I'm, I'm trying to get out there obviously i don't know it's going to be a last minute type of thing but uh i appreciate you coming yeah, on if you do if you do holler at me yeah absolutely absolutely and whenever you come in we'd love to get you in studio talk more about baseball kind of as the season unfolds i know it's super early right now so it's all still kind of speculation but eventually you know it'll kind of get underway and we'll have you back on back on get mike you, on you the got street. it man uh, yeah, you you got it. By, by the way, I like Jared's shirt over there. Michael Jordan's by far the best player in the history hey. of basketball. Oh, you are open up a can of worms. We've had this conversation many a times. <laughs> many a times. All day. All well, day. Good, man. Thank you. I yeah, appreciate man. it, man. Appreciate Thank it. you. Have a good night. All right, bye. bye.